What does it mean to you, this statue? To me? Yeah. Just a statue. It sure doesn't mean what it used to. Why not? Well, just everything that's going on. Like, uh, nobody agreeing on anything. Like our country in a total, you know, state of, you know, nope. All, everybody I know that owns a small business is doing horrible. In the last three, four years, even me, I mean, I was doing great before, you know, um, this recession and depression happened. Everybody's feeling it, even the people that had nothing to do with making the decisions. Mm -hmm. I guess that's all part of living in a democracy. <laughs> you get to share in the good and the bad. Don't answer it. If fear strikes your heart when the phone rings, knowing it may be another bill collector, it's time for you to call Zero Debt in 90 Days. Listen, if you're already in debt, does it make sense to get buried in another payment plan? We begin this hour with the latest jobs report. In a word, disappointing. The unemployment rate ticked up to 9.1%. You, know, you, look, you look at what the banks are getting, talking about Goldman Sachs. They are the ones getting all this money, and mm -hmm. they're telling the people, you've got to suffer, you've got to cut back, and oh, by the way, we're going to raise your taxes, too. That's where the problem is, but it's time to reset. We are going into a depression, one of the greatest depressions in world history, and our decadent, slob-like public could care less. It's not too late to admit we're a sick, decadent, degenerate society crumbling. Forty-six of the 50 American states are on the verge of bankruptcy. The salaries of many government employees aren't being paid. More than 13 million Americans are unemployed. More than 46 million live below the poverty line. Since the latest financial crisis, confidence in the federal government is lower than ever before. In this film, I'm taking a trip across America, looking for people who are looking for new ways of living together. How do they do that? And as governments around the world spiral towards bankruptcy, how can they find alternatives that really work? My trip begins with sociologist Manuel Castells. He's currently doing research into the rise of local communities that are popping up all over the world outside of the establishment. There is a general trend in the world to strengthen local ties, to strengthen direct relationship with friends, neighbors, and this is related to massive distrust of governments, political parties, trade unions, and the political institutions that were constructed during the last two centuries, which at this point, uh, in terms of the data, we have more than 70% of citizens in the world, uh, in every country, including Europe and the United States, think that their political leaders don't represent them. There is, at the same time, a structural process of globalization that uh, gives people everywhere in the world the notion that their government don't control anything because global flows financial markets control their lives. And first, I remind you that there was a collapse in 2008. There was another collapse in 2010. And we are, as we speak, we are preparing for the collapse of 2011. So when the system collapses periodically, it looks like it's not a, a little crisis here and there, that the system is not sustainable. In terms of the proportion of assets that the banks owe and the assets that they have, they have less than 2% of the money they should have. Less than 2%. So you, not only the banks can collapse, you can collapse anytime. When the mainstream economies say uh, the main things people start spending again, 
well, sorry, they are not going to start spending again. Uh, there is a massive increase in savings and a massive decrease in spending. In, in America, uh, which, as you know, is a very prolificate society, people before the crisis were saving about 2% of their income. Now they are saving 10% of their income. And their income is much lower, and therefore they are spending much, much less, which therefore shrinks the basis of capital accumulation. If people stop consumption, the machine stops and it starts producing in a different way. So it's decommodifying capitalists rather than bringing capitalists down. It's a fundamental process that is already going on. What people have? They have their friends, they have their networks, they have their internet networks, and they have their local communities. So therefore, until they can reform the system at in, in, in global terms or in national terms, they are going to be retrenching and building their meaning of life in their local communities because that's what they can't control. If you cannot control the global, you control the local and you make sense of your life in the local. I went looking for some small communities where people are working to organize on a local level. I start in Great Barrington, Massachusetts, a small town of 7,500 inhabitants. Here, residents have established their own currency, the Burke share, so they can be less dependent on the dollar. I'm curious to find out if this is a way to gain independence from the volatility of the world economy. I'd like to have Berkshire, please. Sure. So there's 20, The initiative to establish the Berkshire was begun by Susan Witt, head of the New Economics Institute. Interest from other areas of the country is enormous, especially since the crisis of 2008. Her website gets 42,000 hits a day. This is all land owned by the Community Land Trust, uh, this full 10 acres. And uh, there are four houses here and the New Economics Institute office and library. What we've done is ensure that year-round people have affordable access to land so that they can be here to work, start businesses, and support our local shops. With Berkshires, we're not yet at a truly independent currency. We've still fully backed by the U.S. dollar. If the U.S. government decides to issue more currency to bail out big banks or the auto industry, that means our purchasing power of the dollar falls. If we want to take charge of our own futures economically, we have a tool, and that tool is a regionally based currency. But a regional currency has to have a material that represents the value of the money, just as gold does in the world economy. Could we tie our currency to a cord of wood? We could go, I'll give you two cords of wood for that. You know, it, it, it's something that ties back production to something real, tangible, imaginable. But we found that the price of cord wood fluctuates with the price of oil. When the price of oil is high, every guy with a chainsaw is in cord with production. When the price of oil is low, suddenly the cordwood market drops. 
So now we're looking at thyme birches in the future to a gallon of maple syrup, a bucket of goat cheese, a weighted basket of local commodities so that you'd always have a constant purchasing value in Berkshire's. Fiddlehead ferns, chickpeas, morel mushrooms. That, that's a local product right there. We have a lot of local jams here. This is all stuff that's made pretty much locally. And by locally, we mean it within a 100-mile radius. This is a local granola that we sell right here. This is local. All this yogurt right through here is a local product. Obviously, all our milk is local. Ronnie Brook Dairy, that's a local product. Ilon Farm, local product. This is a local distiller that makes gin, vodka, rum. This is a local product right here. This is a mixer, Berkshire Mountain Distiller, a local beer that we carry. A chocolate. This is made just down the street. Berkshire's, is, it was, it's a great project. You know, it, it benefits the consumer. It benefits us, the local banks. It's gotten a lot of business in our doors, um, especially when it first started. We did about a quarter of a million dollars with the Berkshire business in our first year that we started here. It's a really successful promotion that the local banks, that the local financial institutes um, promoted. We definitely saw our foot traffic pick up when, 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 the pro when it first started, when the program first started. Um, it's sort of as, as petered out a little bit right now. Um, the second year, we took in about $150,000 with the Berkshires. This year here, we've done about $15,000 so far in Berkshire sales. It's on a slow decline right now. A part of the reason that I would think is we took in a quarter of a million dollars of it our first year. We really didn't have anything to do with that quarter of a million dollars except take it back to the bank, and that's defeating the whole purpose of Berkshires. The original purpose is to keep the money out there. So in other words, if the guy that came and removed all our trash would accept Berkshires as a form of payment, or if the local government would accept it as a form of payment for our taxes, or even the people that we buy local produce from, if they would accept Berkshires as a form of payment, then we could keep it out there. Shaping the new economy requires money. With support from the Rockefeller Brothers Fund, the New Economics Institute is trying to solicit funds in New York. Well, good afternoon, everybody. I'm really delighted to see you all here in this quirky old New York institution. It's a good central location for a nice conversation like this, and an important conversation about the new economy, the new New Economy Institute. Personally, I have long felt that we are on a, a path of self-destruction because our whole model of economic thinking is about consumption. The different approaches to economics can produce higher quality of living in a way that is genuinely sustainable. It can give people a sense of well-being and comfort and a sense of community. We are seeing a lot of de uh, development of things at the community level and the local level. Uh, in, in our country, really exciting things. And uh, so we have to think about how do we shift the balance between this headlong globalization that we were in the middle of not long ago and, and really begin to have uh, a, a more emphasis and support for our communities and for localization. accepted Berkshires from from day one this is it's a philosophy I believe in that basically it's just a way to foster local um, economy keeping our money local uh, a lot of my advertisers the local radio station we have a local printing store that uh, all my business cards they print posters for me brochures we used it to pay our employees bonuses the bicycles it's still a trickier situation where uh, nobody's been able to produce decent quality that can be as affordable as it needs to be. So most of these locally produced bikes are anywhere in the range of $1,800 to $10,000 per frame. That's just a frame. I'm 
trying to think if there's anything. That's why I don't know if I want to go with you guys. It's my leg. Yeah, it's it's a it's a sad state of affairs that nothing is produced locally. All helmets, all pumps, all computers, it's all coming from the Orient. And a lot of actually the clothing is made in Italy, but probably the majority of it is made in China. Yeah. We are reliant on the global economy to, to produce bicycles for you know, the majority of our customers. Where we, we would definitely see uh, our local economy um, spring up more local product would be the uh, collapse of the dollar. That's, that's my opinion before I we're going to see a major, a major change. The new economy should offer the solution. But I wonder how autonomous you can really be as a region. Can an independent Berkshire economy hold out even if the dollar collapses? The Wall Street Journal reported recently on the growing number of places across the country where local governments are unpaving the roads. More than 100 miles of road in South Dakota, in 38 counties in Michigan, and it's happening in Ohio, and it's happening in Alabama, and it's happening in Pennsylvania. We're taking an existing 18-foot road, trenching out the side, pulverizing it, and making a 20-foot road. The whole road will be pulverized. It was probably two, three years ago that we did the first ones. And uh, it's becoming more common. Now, sometimes we do very secondary, very rural roads that they, they can't maintain. But we've done uh, probably seven of them 12 miles were county primary roads. They don't have the funding to maintain the pavement. Yeah, you feel like you're going backwards. And I know my guys don't like to talk to people that live on the road because their first question is, you know, when is it going to be repaved? And, so I don't even tell them. They just grind it up and they grade it and leave it. And so, yeah, because people are upset. I mean, I'd rather live on the worst paved road than a gravel road any day. Joining us here on the Frank Beckman Show. Good morning, Mr. Mayor. Good morning, Frank. How are you? I'm very well. How are you doing? I'm doing well. I'm doing well. Now, the last time we spoke, we talked about how the city's population seems to be downsizing. What's going on here? We're probably, I mean, I keep seeing numbers of, um, uh, of somewhere around 70 to 80,000 vacant buildings. Um, they are just way... Uh, too much land um, and, and too much expense for us to continue to manage the city as we have in the past. There are areas in our city um, where we're going to have to make hard decisions to get people to move uh, and move into those communities that I think we can support. So we can't continue uh, to do what we've done in the past because we can't afford to do it more than anything else. And it's not going to be an easy conversation, but it's one that has to be done. There are no easy solutions here. I mean, there are things that should have been done 30, 40 years ago, and it's all coming to a head at one time. So we can't continue to do what we've been doing. Big Brother. Mainstream media. Government cover-ups. You want answers? Well, so does he. And now, live from Austin, Texas, Alex Jones. Texas. Home of radio personality Alex Jones. On his daily radio show, Jones is an outspoken critic of contemporary America, fighting the influence of big business on government. He runs an entirely independent radio station that is primarily funded by contributions from his millions of listeners. You can't really classify him as left or right. 
He's more of an enfant terrible. All commodities from oil to cooking oil uh, to rice to corn, uh, wheat, they're all going up. And on top of that, big agribusiness have positioned themselves, uh, and it's the official policy of, of the Department of Agriculture. They say, get big or get out. So the system is panicking. They see the movement to get off the grid. They see the movement for people to leave the big mega cities and the crumbling inner cities and move to farms uh, and to start becoming self-sufficient. They see the co-ops and communities forming. And so all over the country, the federal government's coming to the states and giving them billions of dollars to set up massive... Jones has no faith in the federal government. He recently decided to live off the grid separate from electricity and water supplies. In the United States, as many as 750,000 families have decided to do the same thing. I'm not off the grid for environmental reasons. I'm off the grid because the power companies and the big monopolies are cheating people and using economic warfare to basically bleed the population like mafia. And if you look at what the big central banks have done in the third world, gouging people for power and water, that's the same system they're starting to develop here. They call it privatization, but it's really not privatization. The government signs over water, power, infrastructure we paid for and built to them, and they double, triple prices. They've doubled prices the last two years in Austin on power. So that's why I'm almost completely off the grid with uh, a well, rainwater uh, collection, and I'm also gonna put in a wind turbine because we have a lot of wind in Texas, works really well. The so-called green movement has been, to a great extent, co-opted by the big mega corporations, and big mega corporations lobby government, and they're given the lion's share of the environmental incentives to then build giant solar farms or giant wind farms, and then over distances, you lose most of the power. So they don't want you having your own windmill your own solar. Some cities pass laws against it or won't send inspectors out to authorize it uh, when you need it right there. And then you get 100%. Uh, you don't get, you know, 60%, 10 miles away of it. We're in the downtown area of the town of Taylor. Uh, much of the uh, city is now a ghost town. More than half the businesses are shut down. Uh, more than half of the buildings uh, are unoccupied. And all that's left is basically uh, government buildings, government workers, a few restaurants. And this once vibrant town uh, is pretty much dead compared to the way it was. And more of the businesses uh, are now shutting down. But there are well, there's a super Walmart outside the town and then another Walmart a few miles away. So it does have two Walmarts. Walmart moves into rural communities with their grocery stores and it immediately turns the vibrant uh, shops and markets into ghost towns. And then they bring in, you know, the GMO food from Mexico and they'll operate for years at prices where they're not even making money in that area. But it's designed to lower the service threshold to lower the quality, to lower the choices, so everybody goes out of business. And then once everybody goes out of business, uh, then they start going up in their prices. We're so dependent on the system. The system's parasitic, and it's all run by big corporations that are just angling to screw people. And they're fighting like hell to keep people from getting off the grid. Alex Jones is furious, and not only on the radio. He regularly mobilizes listeners to protest at the Capitol in Austin. The protesters oppose the federal government's interference in local politics. We are not the property of the criminal offshore banks that have looted this country. And if these senators don't do their job and they cower, we'll replace every one of them. This criminal government will follow the will of the people and the Constitution. Yeah. 
I head for Colorado Springs, a city with a population of 400,000. It's one of the most conservative cities in the United States. Uh, every dollar that the government takes is a dollar that can't be invested in job creation in the private sector. Absolutely. And it's that simple. That's what's driven our economy over the years, that freedom of the average citizen to go out, use their private capital to invest and to make a better life for themselves. The, the, the government might, they may create jobs, but they don't create wealth. Right. Driving that black sand down because that is a magnetizing Here, the traditional mentality of freedom reigns supreme. This means there's a fundamental distrust of government. The population has the right to vote down any attempt to raise taxes. Washington is broken. Washington doesn't give much back in the way of value. Mainly Washington's getting in the way of the rest of the country, not helping it. So that's broken. So what you see now is happening is because people are giving up on Washington. And all the interesting stuff that's going on in America now is going on at the state and the local level because Washington's beyond hope. <laughs> Washington's beyond redemption at this point. So let's, let's fight the battle where we have a chance to, to actually reform government, and that's at the local and then at the state level. Lovely day. So we some some bumper stickers on the back of your car. Yep. And uh, I have to pay the government thirty-five dollars to get a personalized license plate. So what Mr. does it say? Mr. Tabor, Taxpayers' Bill of Rights. I wrote the Taxpayers' Bill of Rights. That's my philosophy. Here's my business card. It says Freedom Fighter. You can have that. Thank you. The Taxpayers' Bill of Rights is two principles. The first is, for any state or local government, they must get voter approval to borrow money or to raise tax rates. The second major feature is a limit on the growth rate of government revenue. About two-thirds of government revenue is limited in its growth. If they wanted to grow more than that, they have to get our permission. If it does grow more than that amount, then we get the money back. People voted for higher taxes maybe three times out of 10. They voted for higher taxes for parks twice. And then they voted once for higher taxes for road work. It does some beneficial things it, it makes the government think twice before they put a tax increase on the ballot. They got to say to themselves, can we sell this? Is this going to win? Earlier this year, officials in Fitchburg, Massachusetts, shut off more than 3,000 of their streetlights. Colorado Springs, Colorado, turned off about 8,000 of theirs. Colorado Springs has also dropped more than 40 of its police officers. And I kid you not, they have auctioned off their police helicopters. Not because crime is over, wahoo, in Colorado Springs. Um, it's because they're broke. We, we now have 80 less police officers than we did in 2005. Um, we have entire units that have actually been disbanded. Uh, but I think we had a 22% increase in homicides last year in the city of Colorado Springs. Uh, this apartment complex is, uh, I've probably been to four or five different homicides or murders here in the last two years. Send me for call screen, one, 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 five, one, five, seven, five. We're a very fiscally conservative city uh, that has very low both property tax rate and sales tax rate. And uh, most of the police budget comes from what's called the sales tax rate. So when the recession hit, people stopped spending as much money. So the local government collected less money um, and has less money to spend on 
what they're responsible for. Police, fire, roads, parks. Um, you can see the, the vacant buildings in here that, you know, three, four years ago, they were filled with businesses. So less business, it means that, uh, you know, less tax collection for sales tax, which funds most of the city services. Available. There is no downside to freedom, financial freedom or personal freedom. But what would the ideal society for you look like? Because if you let neighborhoods deteriorate... I'm not, le would, I'm not letting them deteriorate. I'm leaving people alone. That's what freedom is about. Is It isn't a question of my letting somebody do that. I'm not letting somebody, a white man, hate black people. I'm not letting him do that. People make choices in life. That's what freedom is, is the right to make choices and having the ability to make choices without the government telling you what to do. Is that pool ever gonna be open again? It's my hope that yes, that pool will be open soon. What happened? We just ran out of money from the city, so we had to uh, cut back someplace, and this pool was one of the places we cut back. So just wanted to be sure we had enough police officers and firemen. With Tabor, by forcing all tax increases to be voted on by the people, you really are taking all that power away from your elected officials to decide how to fund your community or your city. I mean, I work hours every time we have a council meeting just reading stacks of papers, trying to learn all the information to make a decision. And the question is, does the average citizen, are they willing to take time to, um, to do the homework necessary to make the best decisions? We have a tax that was passed by the voters about 10 years ago that is known as trails and open space tax. By creating separate taxes, it creates funds and pools of money that can't be used for any other purpose. So in, when two years ago, when we were having so much trouble and trying to keep our parks open, we weren't able to use any of the funds from open space to help maintain the parks during that difficult time. You know, have you ever heard of the Washington Monument tactic? Back in 95, I was living in D.C. at the time, there was a budget crisis and they shut down the government. They didn't shut anything down, but they shut down the Washington Monument, they shut down the national parks, they shut down the passport offices. These are places, you know, somebody needs their passport to go overseas or to go on a trip and they don't get it suddenly, they squawk, they raise hell. Somebody's on their vacation and they show up at the Washington Monument and it's closed, they raise hell. They've done other things here. They pulled the trash cans out of the parks. Come on, that's a small budget item. We don't spend a lot of money on trash cans in parks. Why was that pulled out? It was pulled out to send a message to the voters who use those parks, say, see, when you don't give us the money, you're gonna pay the price. You won't have garbage collection in your parks. Do you know, when we had all those budget cuts, we had requests from citizens to uh, let them pay to have like a street light turned on or to adopt a park in their neighborhood or something. So we created programs. You could adopt a street light, you could adopt a trash can, you could adopt a park. And I had a gentleman come up to me one day who, with a big smile on his face and he said, Thank you so much. I just wrote the city a check for $300 to get the streetlights turned back on on my block. And, um, you know, I was very happy for him and glad we were able to accommodate him. But I said to him, do you remember the tax measure that we did about three, or three months ago, only three months prior? And the, for the average cost home, that tax increase would have been about $200. And I reminded him that if he had been willing to pay the tax of $200, he could have had it all. He could have had the parks, he could have had the restrooms, he could have had the pools, we could have had the street lights, we could have had better maintained streets and uh, more police officers. So my concern is, is that the neighborhoods who can afford 
the amenities will have them. And it's the poorer neighborhoods who can't afford to pay extra that will really begin to suffer. There's a reflexive thinking among some in America that, oh, got a problem? Well, the government should fix it. Well, that's not one, the American way. And number two, it's not always the best way to provide these functions. You know, I was at the West Side Community Center when it was a city-run community center. And I've been there since it's now under private management. And it's night and day. It's cleaner, it's better run, it's better organized now, and it's actually providing the same or better services and at very little cost to the city. So that's what we're experimenting with here in Colorado Springs. <laughs> this is a hard audience, man. They don't, want, they don't want to clap. Maybe it's just because we were a frontier society and people had to step up. But I think that self-reliant attitude continues to, to be deeply ingrained in the American character, and all you have to do is evoke it. In Colorado Springs, they put their trust in the private sector. But what happens if that, too, starts to falter? Who will keep Social Security and other public services afloat? If you haven't seen this story yet this morning, you need to stop what you're doing and take a look. The images will stun you. Up to 50 people are reportedly showing up to the tent city each week. Many of them have lost their jobs and consequently their homes. You know, a lot of people commenting on this on Twitter to us this morning. Uh, Jane Co. wrote that she saw this this morning. She said it's very sad and an upsetting state of this country's affairs. In this country, many people are only one paycheck away from bankruptcy. As we travel through the United States, we come across more and more encampments that offer shelter to the homeless. A comparison to the third world is inevitable, especially when it becomes clear that almost every metropolis has one or more tent cities. I've been here about two months. I lost my job and went through a divorce and uh, just ran out of money, you know, all options. So I, I came here and been part of Tent City for just about two months now. What kind of job did you do? I was in construction, um, general contractor, house remodels. And the market just kind of crashed and life got kind of hard. So I ended up looking, looking, just looking for a place to stay. So you were living in a house. Was was you you owned a house? Or? Yeah, I did till the divorce, and then I um, I got an apartment, but I didn't get uh, unemployment. I didn't get the funds that I needed, and um, was unable to find a job, a good steady job, and um, just kind of down on my luck. So. Um, I first started looking at the shelters in Seattle, and I used to, years ago, I used to work and uh, do charity work for some of them, and um, I, I couldn't even get a bed that night, so I spent the first night on the street, and uh, the next, somebody that night told me about Tent City, uh, and so I drove up, checked it out. Uh, it was a little different place than this one, but, uh, I've been here ever since, you know, and, and it gives you the freedom to come and go and uh, get my life back in order, put things back together, but, you know, when that comes. I brought my kids here, which is, is pretty uncommon, but I had them here last week. They're uh, 14 and 17, and, and it was good for them to come in and see it. And, they were worried about me, you know, where's, where's dad staying and what's it like and, you know, for them to come in and see, see my bed and my, uh, you know, I'm eating and, you know, we ran around, we went and did some fun things that day and um, this isn't usual, you know. There are certain things that aren't as important to me as, as they used to be, and I, right. you know, well, I was raised with this idea that you need a certain job and you need to have a house and a car, and 
the American dream, you know, is what we grew up with. And, and that's what I chased my whole life. I worked so hard chasing after that dream that I didn't take the time to look at some of my own personal issues, you know. And uh, uh, after, you know, you get older and your kids have been raised, all of a sudden you have a lot more time to think and deal with things. And, um, and so this has given me a good, a good point in time to kind of reflect on my life and see what I really want to do. How, how do I want to rebuild? And, and what will I do with my life once, if I get out of here, you know? This first segment is down to nothing, finding food when you're desperate. And starvation is not a great deal more pleasant than most would expect. The body becomes auto-cannibalistic. The carbohydrates in the system are devoured first. The fat follows. If one needs food, you know, you need food. You can't look down on, on anything when you're hungry. You know, grasshoppers, so are like termites, locusts. If it has eight legs or, or less, you know, eat it. In the state of Idaho, we meet Glenn Martin and his son, Tom. They are preppers or survivalists. There are about four million people like them in the U.S. Down here, we heat the house. Uh, we've got a wood stove here. Uh, we get our wood from uh, our property, or we're up here in the mountains, we, we go cut firewood. Then over here, we've got our pantry area where we store our food. We've got spinach, we've got beets, uh, we've got dried foods, we've got canned pears. We've got Mountain House freeze-dried food. I've got MREs. These will last for 10, 20 years, sometimes more. And then if I ever was to go on a trip to a major city or somewhere where I think there could be a chemical disaster of some sort, I've got these uh, face masks to protect from a chemical or biological disaster. We air various programs, all dealing in one way or another with with prepping, growing a garden, a garden, how to how to hunt, how to fend for yourself, how to treat water so you have drinking water. All of these types of things are, are covered on the on the broadcast. My son, he's the one that really got me going a little over a year ago. I know that he had been working American Preppers Network for some time. I immediately was hooked you start to see and hear a lot of things that you don't normally see on regular news or regular TV. And the uh, number of members has just risen dramatically in the last year or so. The economy is a big thing and what's going to come about because of the economy. Uh, a collapse, uh, uh, an economic collapse, uh, most definitely. Are you scared? Scared? Like of, of disasters? Yes. No, I'm not afraid. I'm not afraid at all. I try to be as prepared as I can. And, uh, you know, if the disaster happens, you know, it's going to happen, and I'll just do my best to survive. Peak oil. 
peak oil, which the U.S. Department of Defense says will hit in 2012, is the point when we've maximized worldwide oil production. All the cheap, easy-to-find stuff has been found. So demand starts to outstrip production, and the cost of oil starts to rise permanently. Given that we use oil for everything, energy, transportation, manufacturing, agriculture, medicine, a reduction in supply as global demand increases will have a profound effect not just on our economy, but on almost every facet of the way we live our lives. And thus, the Transition Town Movement was born. Sandpoint, Idaho, population 8,000, is a transition town where the classic American dream has made room for social cohesion and sustainability. John Reuter is a town councillor. He works closely with the Sandpoint Transition Initiative, or STI. No, I'm not sure. What do these do? What are these for? Ah, cool. That's what it is, it's a weed barrier. See, I knew that. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Sandpoint is one of the most photographed small towns in the country. And so this is the gallery, actually, that features this photography. So here we see a picture of what downtown Sandpoint used to be. And what's fascinating is that's our image of where we want to go as a town. It's not that we're trying to get to some new place that we've never been, but trying to go back to something that we were, a vibrant downtown, which is the center of activity. So just people would call it regressive. Some people would say that. They would be wrong. Yeah, no, it's not, it's not. You know, it's an interesting point is that people say, we need to be progressive. We need to look to the future. We need to have all the brand new, sparkly, you know, shininess or whatever. But the reality is, if you look at how we've changed our cities, overall, a lot of the decisions we've made have, have been poor decisions. A lot of them have been wrong. And, and the reason why I believe is that we've had centralized decisions uh, made away from the people actually experiencing them and making it impossible for for the result to be positive. It's very hard to come in and say, you must do the following five things without talking to the people that you're doing those two things, doing those things to, and have it be successful. It works much better if the people who are actually deciding decide their own lives and decide their own fates there. And, uh, and a lot of the policy here hasn't been determined by Sandpoint. I mean, this, this street's a great example because here it's running two ways here. The street that runs through the center of downtown Sandpoint isn't our street, the state controls it. And one of the projects we're working on right now is to actually regain local control of that street so that we can design it in a way that works best for us rather than in a way that works best for the state. I think that the faith in government will only be returned when people have the power to make the decisions for themselves about their future as a community. Every decision that can ought to be relegated back down again. <laughs> We've talked about that in 50 years. My ideal standpoint would be a, a city that is vibrant, sustainable, developing, and not necessarily just growing for growth's sake. In other words, developing our resources that are, are, are positive qualities uh, and doing away with some of the problems that we have in, a, in an isolated area, a real isolated area like this. We have very low wages. Uh, we have a relatively high unemployment rate. Um, and one of the things that I focused on is um, trying to get economic development going um, in a way that's maybe different than some other cities that have basically just said, we don't care what kind of jobs you have or what kind of industry you are, come to town and give jobs. We're really trying to um, attract not only businesses that are compatible, but also provide a way for local people, local entrepreneurs to get a head start. You know, as you can see, you see this diversity of little shops uh, with uh, basic needs, uh, you know, coming together here. And we see this vibrancy here. And here we do, on the, on the middle of a weekday, we see a bunch of people who have come downtown on their bicycles, uh, which is pretty significant, actually. And that, I, I'll say that, that bike rack wasn't there two years ago. There is no shopping centers here. There are no really big box stores here because people rejected them. So they were able to stop that, but they weren't able to quite come up with a positive vision 
in the 80s and the 90s, they started seeing their town change. They said, we don't want these big box stores. We don't want that kind of scale. So they ended up being built one town over. Uh, but what they weren't able to do was come up with a positive vision. And that's part of what STI has been key in having happen here, is in trying to help encourage that positive vision of saying, what does it mean to have a positive view of our future? What does that look like? How do we not just stop things we hate, but actually come up with things that we love? Transition is a social movement that originated in England. People are at the center, not economic growth. Sandpoint is the first of a hundred new transition towns in the United States. STI consists of volunteers. Everyone works hard to improve their town. They work pragmatically, making use of the possibilities that they have. No idealism, no slogans, no revolution. It strikes me as the most hopeful way to a new society. When you go to different groups and you try to explain STI and people's eyes glaze over, when yeah. you say, but have you seen the community garden? That's what we're about. Everyone says, oh yes, I've noticed it. That's fabulous. And then they get on board. All what STI stands for, I have tried to kind of formulate in what I sent you. Um, transition in a nutshell, you could say, is transitioning from a way of living that uses unrenewable resources that are depleting and causing shortages, resource shortages, um, and are also responsible, at least partly, in climate change. Transition from that way of living, uh, with including a lot of consumption, to a different way of living. And the difference between transition and other social movements is that we um, are really committed to raising awareness and building networks in our community. So we are building on the work of all the people that have gone before us and try to get the groups starting to work together so that we're cooperating instead of competing for resources and that we're sharing a vision. No, it's right. both ends. No. But I do really get the sense that meeting should be at 6, 7 o'clock with potluck and wine every okay. time. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Well, we had several rehearsals before. <laughs> In 1911. Okay. Armed society is a polite society. I'm I'm less likely to cause trouble when I'm armed because it, it's too much of a responsibility to start trouble when you're armed. The last thing you want to do is pull this out. You never put yourself in that situation. Never. If you but if it comes to me, my family, walking down the street, some guy wants to rob me, sorry, you're gonna, you're gonna die. No, because I'm not putting my, my family in harm's way. In Idaho, we've, uh, m more people are apt to, uh, to carry a firearm. It's um, something I've been associated with since I was a little kid growing up. Um, my father had guns, his father had guns. We grew up with BB guns, and then and as we learned, we got our 22s, learned to shoot at, at, at high school. Just something I've always grown up with, and it's no different than the piano in my house or uh, some of the books or, uh, you know, some of the other things that, that are passed down from my family. To me, that's, that's out there, but that's kind of North Idaho. <laughs> but those kind of conversations really don't come up. It's not, you know, politics really aren't discussed at the garden. They're not discussed at the other functions that STI does because it's not about that. It's about humanity and it's about the community and uh, how we can help each other. Are you aware of how they try to make it a more a greener city, for instance? Well, a lot of things happening now in Sandpoint with, our, with this new freeway system that's fixing to, they called it the bypass for years and years and years, rather than the truck route. But um, yeah, we have the ability now to redesign our downtown area from a two-lane or a one-way 
roadway with the cow trucks full of cows going to the slaughterhouse and and we can make the little artsy community tea sipping coffee drinking croissant eating type of a of a deal downtown and make a nice little destination spot and i hope everybody embraces that and gets behind it and and we'll just sit over here on the corner with our big smoking gun out front and, uh, and and the people that want to come deal with us will come here and the people that want to stop downtown and sip tea can stop downtown when we talk about real things, when we talk about what's really happening, when we talk about a real street or a real place, you can get people to come together. On the other hand, I think, I think it's really good to contrast this versus what happens in D.C. In D.C., we have people on one side and we have people on the other side. And they even have, uh, they even actually sit on opposite sides of chambers to argue with each other. So it's set up like a battle. Uh, when we sit together in Sandpoint, we all sit at the same table together and we say, how do we succeed all together? Uh, there's very conservative people and there's very liberal people. But when they come together, they don't think of each other as liberals and conservatives. They think of each other as trying to figure out how do we solve this problem. For decades, decades, we've had this pressure from, uh, from people outside of our community trying to move us in exactly the opposite direction, trying to move us more towards having more chemicals in our parks rather than less, trying to make our roads wider rather than narrowing them and making them better for bicycles and pedestrians. The force of both corporations and the federal government and the state government and, and outside forces trying to push us in exactly the opposite direction we're going, that these small steps are actually radical, not because they're moving in this direction uh, so dramatically, but because they're not moving the other way and we're starting to make progress in this direction. If you start asking, calling on people to do radical changes, if you start saying, we need to change the climate immediately, we need to do something today, it's an impossible challenge. Uh, I cannot fix the global climate. I cannot fix global poverty. I cannot fix our global uh, transportation system. These things are not these things are not possible within my grasp, but they are within our community's grasp to fix small pieces of those things and make our world a little more equitable, a little more just, and a little bit better and more pleasant for people to live in. Sandpoint goes against the current. Or maybe you should say that it plots its own course, just as an increasing number of local communities and individuals are doing. Life is where you live, and it shouldn't depend on a system. But letting go of that system isn't easy, especially when you've been relying on it for decades. But they're off to a good start, and after this trip, I get the feeling that more and more people are finding their own way in life. At the end of the trip, we meet Lamar Hill. After 28 years with the same company, Lamar lost his job and has been on the streets for six months. He lives beyond the American dream. These are my dad's dog tags. That's all I have left. Yeah, my dad's dog tags from World War II. He was in World War II? Yes, yes. Now, I don't have any pictures of my family left or anything. But I found these, and I, I, don't, I don't take them off. <laughs> yeah, I'm going to hang on to them. That's the last thing I've got. I know a lot of people are like living glass houses. You know, they, they don't, you know, say, so to speak, ha have it made. You know, and I'm glad for them. I mean, I've had that life. I've had two houses at one time. I've had everything a person could want, you know, in life. You know, like I said, I know that I will be able to make it. What scares me is, will they be able to make it if they're put in my shoes? Wilt u naar aanleiding van deze uitzending reageren of een gratis programmagids bestellen? Bezoek dan onze website boeddhistischeomroep.nl DVD's van onze programma's kunt u bestellen op 010 411 3977.